Our beloved Dr. William Toffler is going to speak. Uh, many of you have heard him before. He's an excellent speaker. He's a professor emeritus of family medicine up at OHSU. Um, he's the co-founder and national director of Physicians for Compassionate Care Education Foundation. And as we all know, he's very committed to defending the longstanding prohibition against doing no harm. He's also been widely seen on various TV and radio shows speaking out for life. Dr. Toffler. Thank you, Deborah. God bless you. So it's a, it's a delight to be here. I feel naked here a little bit. I don't have a computer in front of me. Um, you know, I, I realize that these meetings are, are important. I just uh, was flattered by someone came up and said he, he'd heard me... Uh, two decades ago and still remembered some of the talk. You know, I wish my kids would listen to me as well as that. Uh, I am blessed with kids. I have seven. In fact, I, my 22nd grandchild is coming in just uh, a couple of months. So I, we are blessed and thank you. Um, you know, this is a highly relevant topic. We are in the, in the state that began this whole mess of the solution to suffering is to end the life of the sufferer. And we have couched it always in the, the, the euphemism, death with dignity. And one of the things that was just said to me too is that we have to remember words are important. I think that was important as you listen to the last speaker and driving the culture, how you frame things. But you know, all social engineering is preceded by verbal engineering. And that has been true from eternity. And so in, you're gonna hear in my talk where people have used these euphemisms and that carry forth their agenda. It was true just this past Wednesday as I debated uh, Peter Reagan, one of my colleagues, and, and, and I'm really a friend. Uh, I've known him for over 35 years who has got high integrity, but at the same time, he and I are diametrically opposed that the solution to suffering is to end the life of the sufferer. And so we had a debate, and it was a very respectful debate. I wish that all of our discussions were like the previous speaker said we should be shooting for is to have a high level of respectful debate that isn't just sunk into emotional rhetoric and, and really just antagonistic name calling. So without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and try to share with you what my goals are here. And it's pretty simple, these three things. I'm gonna talk about assisted suicide, assisted suicide and euthanasia. And it really is a symptom of our secular ethics today the inherent risk and pitfalls. So even if you aren't deliberately thinking about this for you or your loved ones, how it can actually affect you and impact you and your families. And then I want to always leave on a high note as how do we respond when people are feeling desperate and despondent to the point where they feel like their life has no further use. So um, it begins with what is the uh, framework on which operator, doctors operate? And this is actually data from a study by Robert Orr and Pellegrino. Pellegrino was the head of the Center for Ethics at Georgetown and actually is now named after him. He was a true ethicist who had an ethic. Now you think about the word ethics and you sort of say, well, you, you could belong to a center for ethics. Not today, most centers of ethics would not take someone like me because I have an ethic. <laughs> if you want to talk about ethical concepts, then it's okay. You're welcome to the table. But you really can't have an ethic because that would be opinionated and you'd be imposing your viewpoint on others. And yet when you think about that, just, just think about, do we really have neutrality and as a principle that's always a good thing? And are you neutral on slavery as an example? Are you neutral on wife beating? Are you neutral on child beating? And, and the answer is no, of course not. And even if the society was misguided enough to embrace those at one time, it is not something that you can be neutral about without violating the inherent value of all human life, which is an easy ethic to understand and commit to. And it's also one that's getting eroded because as you see in these slides here, only 8% of the oaths at the time this was done, and this is in 1997, prohibit abortion. Now, I don't think there are any in this country. I know when I traveled to Australia to try to fight against assisted suicide there some years ago, the University of Notre Dame, not the University of Notre Dame that I went to, but the one in Australia, 
actually has their medical school reciting the original Hippocratic Oath. And so it's when you start with a framework of teaching young doctors that you can make up your own, and that's essentially what's happening. It's gotten worse. In medical schools now, you literally can make up your own oath. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, your oath can be, I, I pledge to do the best to my ability. Well, Kevorkian could say that, and he did. He killed 130 people in the back of his Volkswagen van, uh, some of whom had nothing wrong with them. So they include social activism, self-care. I suppose global warming is in there. It's, it's not that you, whether you believe in these things or not as being issues, what do they have to do with protecting you? I mean, when I, you looked at the data from Pellegrino's study, only 3% had a prohibition against sexual relations with your patients. I mean, think we're in the day of Harvey Weinstein, for heaven's sakes. Couldn't you at least slip that in there? So this was a debate just three days ago. I try to make my topic uh, relevant and current. So he has written, Dr. Reagan is a good doctor, by the way. Don't let me at all come across deprecating. He's a friend, as I said. He's a colleague. He, he was formerly a, a student of mine. His wife, Bonnie Reagan, was a resident. I, I love both of them. But they are very much of a different worldview than am I. And he's written 25 prescriptions. Now, if you take the total number of people who've ended their lives, which is about 1,500 in the state of Oregon since it became enacted into law uh, in 97, really. It was 94 when the ballot measure passed. It was tied up in courts. And in 97, it became law. And 98 was the first death. Well, Dr. Reagan actually was involved with the first death, Helen, in March of 1998. He's also a national advocate for the so-called compassion and choices. Why do I say so-called? Because the word compassion means to suffer with. What does, have, what does killing a patient or helping a patient kill themselves have to do with suffering? In fact, one of the famous cases that I spoke about in my opening remarks was Michael Freeland, who was a man who had had cyclical depression all of his life. He was diagnosed with lung cancer and then mistook our organization, Physicians for Compassionate Care, with the so-called compassion and choices. And instead of getting a vending machine answer, he got one of our colleagues, Kathy Hamilton, who basically didn't just give him what he wanted, which was suicide pills. He said, gosh, you, what's going on? You, you want to end your life. You must be hurting. And indeed he was. He actually had such pain that uh, he wanted to end his life. So he was given the the contact information of one of our pain management specialists within our organization, and his pain went away and he ceased, at least temporarily, this desire to end his life. But he had a problem with depression that came and go. It was gone on for decades. So he did find uh, a solution with a different doctor, Dr. Peter Reagan, who gave him the overdose. Now, it wasn't because Dr. Reagan is a bad doctor, but he could not have diagnosed and didn't actually his recurrent depression in the time because he came across as a person who just seemed very reasonable and wanting to end his life. And in a utilitarian model, Dr. Reagan wrote the prescription. As it turned out, he actually went through another cycle of depression and even homicidal ideations, not just suicidal, and was admitted against his will to St. Vincent's Hospital. And I'm able to tell you all these details because he actually gave us permission to, to review the entire record. And it's the only case out of the 1500 where we have access to the entire records. Otherwise, it's all hearsay, second and third hand information about what's actually going on. So, oddly enough, I only learned that Dr. Reagan had written the prescription for that case uh, about 48 hours before I presented this. And it was actually, it's actually in the public domain. You can see what I'm saying is true by just Googling it. As it turns out, though, he was admitted to the hospital, the, Michael Freeland, and he basically um, had a stay in the hospital for quite a while. They actually sent the police to his home to, to, to see what's going on because he's homicidal. And he actually, they actually found 32 weapons and thousands of rounds of ammunition. And they removed those from the, his dwelling. But they left the overdose. And we know that because in the discharge summary, the psychiatrist wrote that you know, follow-up may be a moot point, 
because he has this overdose at home, which is the first and only case I know of where a psychiatrist knows that someone has a lethal dose and they discharge him, which I think is medical malpractice to, to do this. But that's what happened. Well, fortunately, with the support of Kathy Hamilton, uh, Dr. Greg Hamilton's spouse, and he, she was trained formally in psychiatry and psychology, and she continued a relationship with him, actually made home visits, and he never took his life with the overdose, and he lived almost 23 months past the predicted six months that's supposed to be part of the law, and he actually was able to reconcile with his daughter, and the case came out very well. But in sharing this case, and in the rebuttal from the debate just three days ago, Dr. Reagan actually spent a lot of time on this case. And to his credit, he actually anguished over the fact that he was involved in this and realized that it didn't go and he had not detected the depression. But at least in his integrity of saying that, you know that doctors are fallible. We don't always know what's going on with a person, nor do they reveal it. And I've certainly made my share of mistakes in, in my career. And I thank God that patients have forgiven me for the things that I've done that haven't been that great. So he's an advocate for the similar kind of laws. And I, I hope that with our dialogue, and this is why I think one of the things we have to do is be able to respect, even love people who are our opponents, because we're trying to convert hearts. We're not trying to win debates. And my hope is that um, Dr. Reagan would be able to see, you know, this isn't such a guided paradigm after all. So here's Dr. Gene Uphoff, who is actually also, uh, I think, now retired, but he was one of Dr. Reagan's partners. This is what he said, and it just shows how, how slippery the slope is. That was one of the questions of what's the evidence of a slippery slope. Uh, interpretation of the law by opponents, it should include, it's overly narrow now. Depression, like I just described in Michael Freeland's case, should be allowed because uh, depression shouldn't make it impossible for a doctor's assistance in anyone's life. Now, this is a terrible conflict of interest. It's an inherent conflict of interest. One of the points I made in the question and answer period was that, you know, it's a little bit like the questioner was at the microphone. I said, suppose I'm guilty of a capital crime and you're my lawyer defending me. And during the case, I'm kind of surprised because you go across the aisle and now you're working with the prosecution in the same case. Wouldn't that be kind of a conflict of interest? But, you know, it's not only that, if you're not bothered by that, you're also the judge deciding which lawyer has the best argument. And if you're not bothered by that, you're also the, the executioner who has given and empowered to actually help the person to be executed, if you will. I have never heard anybody give a reasoned response other than say that somehow doctors can keep all these things straight. And that's why I started with the oath and what do we all, what's our common ground? And of course, it's eroding. So what's this whole talk about is, are you at risk? Yeah, Which, what's your doctor believe about these? Have you ever asked him or her? It's possible that you're at risk. So Dr. David Grube, he's actually here in Oregon also. These are three star leaders in the, in the movement, either formally, like Dr. Grube is, who's the national director for the so-called Compassion and Choices. Now, you'll note whenever I use this euphemism that they've titled themselves, I use the word so-called. I, I will never use, unless I'm slipping, the, the words that are actually carrying water for the devil, if you will. You're, you're furthering the myth that this is somehow compassionate. It's really dispassionate, isn't it? Because when you come to me and I, I'm the person talking to you and I'm willing to go either way, pull this lever and I'll help you to continue to extend your life, pull this lever and I'll help you to end your life, it's your choice. Is that compassion or is it apathy? I'm apathetic. I, I'm literally dispassionate, if you will, about whether you continue to live or die. I don't think you want a doctor like that. If you want that kind of expertise, go to somebody outside of medicine who has expertise. And by the way, you don't have to be. As I'll show you later, there are lots of non-assisted suicides in the country and the, the rate's not going down, it's going up. So Dr. Grube believes that many of the well-intentioned regulatory requirements are more barricades than safeguards. This is actually something he wrote just last year. So what used to be the safeguards that have been promulgated all over the world, literally, from the great example of Oregon over the last decade, two decades and more, are actually barriers. That's the slippery slope. He boasted at a 
and I just learned this this last week too, while this is very fresh, is one of the people that I'm working with to start a fully Catholic practice, having no longer been at, at, uh, the universe, uh, at Oregon Health and Science University, shared with me, because he happens to hang out in the Corvallis area in Philomath where Dr. Grube had his practice uh, beginning about you know, 40 years ago. He boasted that Oregon hospices, over 90% of them have medical directors involved with assisted suicide. Now that's personal communication. I haven't talked to Dr. Grube about this, but I trust the man that, that shared the information with me. So you should be a bit at risk if you go into a hospice. What's the hospice and what do they believe? Do they allow assisted suicide to go into that hospice? And I'm also on a subcommittee of a committee by the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops is holding a committee on palliative care and hospice care. And, and I think palliative care doctors are often really dedicated to giving you good relief of your suffering and extending your life and mitigating it, even if you're not terminal. That's what palliative care is about. But some of them are directors of hospices. And if this statistic is correct, and I say if because that's hearsay, it's a little dangerous to enter a hospice without knowing what they believe in. What are the tools in their toolbox? Will they go there or not? So these people are not alone. Dr. Reagan, Dr. Uphoff, and Dr. Grube. Um, Ezekiel Emanuel, who's a famous ethicist for this country, has written 10 times more articles than I have in my career. He says, once I've lived to the age of 75, why I hope to die at 75, my approach to my health care will be completely changed. I won't actively end my life, but I won't try to prolong it either. Now, look at the words. I'm so glad that I was given the point to emphasize language. Prolong. Well, I have this prolonged illness. No, I want to extend my life. I'd like to not prolong it. I'd like to extend it. And language is so important. When you're older, you no longer are creative. You become feeble. I guess that includes me. I'm 71 now. Uh, against PSA, PAS, he's against uh, assisted suicide and euthanasia, and yet he has these beliefs that basically inherently are saying that I believe some lives aren't as valuable. And he's giving good evidence based on statistics of, you know, what Einstein, when he was at his peak and most creative and all that sort of thing. You know, even if I'm not creative, I'd like to be around to be, park me in the corner of the room, let my children, my grandchildren laugh and carry on. Just let me be, you know, even if I'm not being productive. And I'd like all of you to have that privilege to too. And I'd like you to have the same respect I have when I meet a veteran of World War II, for heaven's sakes. What a giant, you know, and what a privilege it is to be with somebody who sacrificed everything. You know, that little sim, unspoke, unspoken valor by a... Uh, one of the Fox people that wrote a book about her father who died on Iwo Jima. When are we going to have reverence for our agent is the point. So Derek Humphrey makes the case, economics makes the case for euthanasia. That was in 1998, just after we passed this. In other words, he's thinking this is a good way. And on the other hand, when Derek Humphrey had his heart attack and he went to a hospital in Eugene, Michael Bloomer, you know, has actually said, and you've seen this on tapes that have been rolling recently in politics, of him saying, you know, hey, the elderly should be denied treatment to cut costs. This is a presidential candidate right now. On the other hand, Bernie Sanders, who's 80, 80, or 78, he thinks, you know, full treatment for his heart attack was a good idea. Well, I do too. Even though I don't agree with most of what he says, but the reality is he's a good person who's got a lot of misguided ideas that he's had ever since he was young. I, they're so stamped in his head, I don't think we could have a reasonable debate about him anymore. I mean, he literally is asking us to look at Cuba for educational innovation. You can't make this up. So... Our conscience protections are under attack. I mean, I, I said my contract wasn't renewed and because I had the audacity to talk about the side effects of contraception and all with a young 21-year-old pre-med student. These are facts and basically, you know, her complaint, not to me, but in writing was that I made her feel guilty about this, you know? Well, I make some people feel guilty about smoking too. Nobody complains. They actually say, way to go, Dr. Toffer. You did a good job there, you know? You planted a seed. But with the tremendous harms of contraception, and I'm here not to talk about contraception per se, but I want to, you know there's a 98-page booklet that was submitted to the Food and Drug Administration by 10 of my colleagues, PhDs, MDs, and the like, 
speaking about the multiple serious effects that are not in the package insert when you go buy your oral contraceptives. They include osteoporosis, they include breast cancer, they include cervical cancer, sexually transmitted infections, depression and mental health status changes, clots in your legs, atherosclerosis. And if you're not bothered by those and some other medical facts that are not quite as strongly correlated like inflammatory bowel disease, like multiple sclerosis, and like lupus, you might want to be, be concerned since you're in Oregon about the fish, you know, because when the urine goes out with the contraceptive in it, into the, it doesn't get filtered out by the aeration and all that. You need charcoal filtration. So they've even passed laws in Europe where that has to be the case by, I think, 2030, where the sewage effluent is not going to go in the stream before it gets charcoal filtered. Don't you think that women ought to be told these things before they have to worry, or should they worry their pretty little heads about these things? I mean... So this is a problem. This is a survey of a couple thousand physicians, and it shows you where they are. Most felt they were obligated to prevent, present all options. So I'm in Oregon. I have to present a suicide, assisted suicide is what they're saying. Most say it's ethically okay to describe their objection, but this caused a great furor when some said this. It's a, um, you know, because uh, I'll tell you in the New York Times in a moment here, but they, they say you've got to present all options, and the vast majority of doctors say this, 86%. You have to refer, almost three quarters of doctors believe this. But then if you look at what the public reaction to this was, the New York Times, this great edifice that historically is no longer with its roots, because it used to be a great newspaper. Although the closed mouth doctors claim a right to follow their consciousness, they're grievously failing their patients. They seem to have forgotten the age old admonition to do no harm. Well, I haven't forgot the informed consent one. I haven't forgot my conscience with my Hippocratic oath that I did take in 1971 at the Medical College of Virginia. And so it depends on how you define harm. And of course, the proponents of assisted suicide and euthanasia believe that it's harmful not to give this option to people who might be suffering at the end of life. The solution to suffering is to end the life of the sufferer. They lament that 17% objected to terminal sedation. Now, terminal sedation is not something that necessarily is unethical, but I can tell you in my 40 plus year career, I've never had to use it. I can give people great pain melodies and then lighten it and they can interact with the world and they can go back and have a rest. Um, but it's not intrinsically wrong if there's no other way to stay on top of your pain. 42% objected to prescribing birth controls for adolescents. I'm guilty. Uh, and I wouldn't have done it even with parental improvement because the parents probably love their child, but they also don't realize what they're doing because they haven't been informed, which is why there's a 98-page petition to the FDA to better inform people. 52% opposed abortion for failed contraception. Guilty. I'm in this study here, I guess. At any rate, tens of millions of Americans probably have such doctors and are unaware of their attitudes. Well. You know, I don't want to, in fact, I remember being, the ethics police came to my office when I was in the second oldest building at OHSU, Emma Jones Hall, and they said, you know, Dr. Toffer, you don't do this, and what do you do? I said, well, I, I tell people I just don't do it, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't help them, and I'll, there's no charge for the it is, they're bothered. And, but still, they had to come in, they wasted their time coming to see you because you wouldn't fill their need. I said, that's true, but I, I can't really help it. And he said, well, maybe we can post a sign in a waiting room to say what you do and you don't do. I said, well, you know, that's a good idea. Why don't we post a sign in a waiting room for, about what each doctor does and doesn't do? And she said, oh, I don't think we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I thought we want full disclosure. I mean, it's astonishing how they twist themselves in a pretzel, if you will, in trying to control what someone like myself with an ethic is trying to do versus my colleagues who have a whole different ethic. And the New York Times went on to say, any doctors who can't talk to patients about legally permitted care because it conflicts with their values should give up the practice of medicine. How is this going to help access to care? You know, at the time I saw some of this, it came out, I was in rural Oregon. There weren't too many doctors there in Sweet Home, Oregon, you know. And so oh, you're supposed to move to a city was one of their other solutions. The, the American, Medi no, the OBGYN Society came up with ACOG, American College of OBGYNs. They said, if you don't do these things, you should move to a place where it's easy access, like Portland, Oregon, which I did do, but not for that reason. But, the, you know, it's, it's like, how, how in the world is that helping access for the 99.9 .9 other things that doctors do and the harm that that causes? 
So, you know, the conscience thing is important. I wrote this just, a, I think, a year ago, maybe a year and a half. There are new protections. I was trying to support the new protections coming from this current administration. Again, it's not a political talk, but it's, I'm just simply talking about this administration is more friendly to people like myself than the previous one. I'm a family physician who's been practiced for the past 40 years, predominantly in Oregon, where assisted suicide has been legal for over 20 years, and abortion is legal up to the moment of birth. I do not engage in these immoral acts, nor will I engage in referral for these immoral acts. I strongly support the need for enforcement of federal conscience and anti-discrimination laws as expressed by the current proposed rules by the Office of Management and Budget. And then, you know, that's all good, and we got new protections as a result of many people besides myself supporting this, especially political, courageous political leaders. So it's designed to protect the religious rights of healthcare providers and religious institutions. It affirms existing conscience protections established by Congress, because they actually were all there. They just never got enforced. They were ignored. But the Office of Civil Rights designated a law enforcement agency designated as a law enforcement agent that enforces civil rights laws and conscious and religious freedom laws, protects and exercises religious beliefs and moral convictions by individuals and institutions. That was in May of last year. Good job. And then, of course, what happens? The courts overruled it. And so they, this is their reasoning. There's no Health and Human Services Authority for substantive portions of this law that got passed. Stopping recipients' federal funding for breach rule is unconstitutional. In other words, what it would say is that OHSU doesn't tolerate me and my conscience. They would be restricted in the millions and millions and millions of dollars that they get for research or things from the federal government. In other words, if you want to get this federal government, you have to allow people to exercise their conscience. That's now tied up in courts, and that's what seems to inevitably happen as we have courts that for years got loaded with people who wanted to have their own view of the Constitution of what it says or doesn't say. So you're at risk depending on a lot of things. One are your occupation. Are you in an occupation where basically uh, you might have to succumb to these things and you compromise your integrity? Uh, and that happens. I mean, I, I, one of the people I tried to call yesterday is in charge of a group of OBGYNs here in the People's, Re well, People's Republic of Portland. And basically, <laughs> he... He, he is somebody who's presiding over a practice that I think involves abortion uh, heavily. I know at least one of the doctors in there doesn't do those, and she got quite a bit of flack for her position, almost had to leave. I almost would be glad if she did leave so you can join our practice wherever we're going to found it, in Lake Oswego or West Lynn. Um, who's our president? That's critical, and that's why if you all don't vote, you are derelict in your duty. I know it seems futile, but you... you you know, I heard on the radio just yesterday that if everybody who's registered a certain denomination was actually go vote, we would win these things. It's just that we don't do it. We are not active. <laughs> you need to keep your job and support your family. So many people are, are kind of tied. I, I, and I remember being fearful about this myself when I first uh, decided not to prescribe contraception in 1993. Um, I was an assistant professor at the time. I think I had seven kids by that time. Uh, I, I, was, I was so worried about making this step in faith that I, I, I said, can I keep my job? I, am I able to be able to support my family? And I, I didn't even tell my wife, my late wife at that time, because uh, if I did, she might hold me a hand to the fire before I was ready to do it. You know? But I took a step in faith, and sure enough, it, 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 it went well. You know, I, I, I don't have time to tell you all the details, but um, it was life-giving. Uh, it, it does take a bit to step out of your role, but if you're in an occupation where you're compromising your faith, your belief, your inherent respect for the value of all human life, I would encourage you to take that step in faith. Come talk to me. I'll tell you the details. Um, who's the judge reviewing your case is one of the big things because I, I've seen people who have been, you know, Bill Diss as an example comes to my mind, who stood up for his faith, his beliefs, his, his not wanting to contaminate young adolescents with birth control being pushed by Planned Parenthood. He lost his job over it and the, and the judge didn't rule in his favor. The judges, it was a three-part federal judge that happened. To, um, on the other hand, everyone's at risk if the solution of suffering is to end the life of the sufferer. So, Derek Humphrey has done a lot of bad things directly, including his being the mastermind behind getting assisted suicide embraced in Oregon after having failed in Washington and California in 1994. But this whole book, Final Exit and Exit, How to Do Things, 
There is a suicide contagion. There's a suicide encouragement for non-assisted suicide. And so this Tora Grossa found her son's body, a, a book, a copy of Final Exit. And Final Exit is a, is a how-to guide for people who want to end their lives. And of course, it explains how you'd replace the air that your body needs to continue to live with helium. Again, I'm not recommending any of these. I'm just telling you this is what happens. So when I was in Australia, I remember they used to, at the end of an article talking about a triple suicide between two daughters and her mother, their mother, they had a little disclaimer at the end. If you're feeling depressed or whatever you call this number, it's mandated in Australia that you do that because they value that people not end their lives with, with suicide. I'm often thinking about that. Is that if this is death with dignity to kill yourself at the end of life for whatever circumstantial reasons regarding your health, then why shouldn't we be celebrating other people who, who, who want to end their lives at other times? Well, they... they, they chose what they wanted to do. You know, they, they had what they considered with death with dignity given the circumstances. One of the people in a question answer at, at the debate a couple nights ago was basically saying, well, you know, Dr. Reagan, what would you do if, if you came across somebody on the bridge and they were about to jump off and they told you, uh, you jump and you're thinking, I got to stop him somehow because that's a natural inclination for most of us. And then the person tells you that, but I've got cancer and I'm ready to live. You know, I've got to go through chemo care. I don't want to do all that. I'm ready to die. And I want you to help me. I, it's hard to jump. Push me, will you? <laughs> you know, to his credit, again, he had integrity. It, it stymied him a little bit because it causes him to think about how we, we have a dichotomous model of treatment about people who are desperate and despondent and feel like they have nowhere else to go. Um, so this is what's happened because we've elevated suicide. We, we call it death with dignity now, the so-called death with dignity. And the total suicide rate, not just in the United States, but here in Oregon, we're among the top states, as is Washington and California. And you sort of see when you decrease the sensitivity about this being a, a, a big deal, in fact, you even say it's, it's death with dignity, it has an impact. The risk varies by state, and of course, I didn't actually put a corresponding state about suicide rates here, but I want you to know your risk as an individual living in one of these states and encountering a doctor who might not have quite such unambiguous views of the inherent value of your life as do I, you are at risk. And so just to show you, the blue states are the ones that have passed law. There are nine states plus the District of Columbia. The other ones are trying to uh, legalize it, the ones that are in... Um, Let's see, the, no, the dark blue have had got legislation, and this light blue, I guess, is what I'm putting up there, not real light blue. And the gray doesn't show up well. Those are the people that don't have uh, anything on except for the volunteer activity going on. But the point is that nine states, now remember, 10 states have actually passed stronger laws and restrictions against assisted suicide with penalties. So when you think this is an inevitable um, domino effect, it's really not. And they're, they're, they're outspending us at least 10 to 1, and they're still losing. And I think that's, um, that's minor miracle by itself. And it, it, about a third of the country, though, lives in states where you're at risk of who are you seeing as a doctor and the like. It varies by country, of course. And um, I've got this little tape here. Uh, I think I've shown this before, but I just want to show you how cavalier it is and how quickly. Now, it's up to 13,000 deaths in Canada, and so this is our neighbors to the north. Quebec's doctors are set to become the first in the country to practice legal euthanasia. Beginning on December 10th, the province will become the only jurisdiction in Canada allowing doctors to assist in the death of a patient. As Mike Armstrong reports, it is a sensitive subject, and each case will be handled according to strict guidelines. It is the exact opposite of what doctors are used to. Instead of prolonging life, next week Quebec physicians will find out how they will end life. After months of analyzing the experiences in other countries, jurisdictions like Belgium and the Netherlands, Quebec has developed its own model. For us it was important that it has to be done in a short period of time and with a better control on the effect. Now, in some places, euthanasia is done orally with pills, but there have been problems, patients who can't swallow or throw them up. Quebec will instead use a sequence of injections, a kit with three different medications. They'll be given intravenously one after another. The first will be a drug to relax the patient, something like Valium. The second will be a barbiturate, a drug to put the patient into a coma. 
The last one will be a muscle paralyzing drug that will stop the patient's lungs. There will also be extra medication in the event the first doses aren't enough. If it doesn't work, there is a possibility of having the same drugs with the same dosages uh, twice in the same kit. The whole process, we're told, will take about 15 minutes. Dr. Mitch Shulman is commending the College of Physicians. Its plan, he says, is well thought out and it's being released early enough for doctors to discuss it and prepare for it. This is something most doctors have no experience with. My job is to bring you back from death, to stop death in its place. Over the next couple of months, doctors will be given training sessions. Each hospital will, by law, as of December, have to provide this new service. There will be strict criteria on who's eligible. Patients have to give consent and be suffering from an incurable condition. Now, doctors can refuse to help patients die, and some are promising to fight the law. It's a homicide. I mean, up until now, it's always been a crime, right, to do that. And now it's a, something that they call a health care, which I don't agree with. The Quebec experience will have an impact in the rest of the country. Other provinces are already watching closely how this system is being set up. The Canadian Medical Association is calling for national standards from coast to coast. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. So Canada is way ahead of the entire country in terms of assisted suicide. It's not assisted suicide in Canada. It's all but five cases are euthanasia. Exactly what you saw. Now, the three drugs they talked about are exactly the same drugs combination are used with the death penalty in this country. If you have a state that does, still does a death penalty, you basically give a tranquilizer, then you give a sedative so the person's unconscious, and then you give a muscle paralyzing agent. So the same treatment that is seen as unethical by many people in the country in terms of a first world country needing to do the death penalty is seen as compassionate if you happen to have a uh, terminal diagnosis. Now, terminal diagnosis, of course, has changed too. Now, if you have diabetes and you choose to stop using your insulin, you are a candidate. And indeed, just last year, a couple of people with diabetes were, that was the, that was the underlying disease. How many people think of diabetes as a terminal illness? You know, I, I have people who built my deck, a uh, very pro-life family in Salem, that uh, he's had diabetes for as long as I've known him. And so is his, I think at the time, 16 year old son, they made the diagnosis themselves. They're so adept at managing it and they're both healthy as horses and compete in bicycle races. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's astonishing that you see that and that's it. So you see uh, this almost all by euthanasia, which is injection, the doctors have to refer in Quebec now, or you'd lose your license. Exactly what the New York Times said should happen to me because I have moral objections to many practices in our country, in this state in particular. Um, it's unconstitutional to deny Canadians the right to die, the so-called right to die. Is anybody in the room not have a right to die? <laughs> I mean, language. Now, it's not just in Canada, where they're manipulating language, and here as well, um, ingest is literally being fought over in the, in the legislature. Ingest is now going to mean that it could be in the mouth, it could be in the rectum, it could be by a feeding tube or an intravenous tube. And so when you get into intravenous tubes, you're really talking about uh, euthanasia. How many of you started an IV on yourself? Maybe some nurses in here. No, I don't see anybody. And I haven't. But that's literally what the head of medical oncology at OHSU was arguing for to, to change the meaning of the word ingest to include injections, and that is essentially euthanasia. So, because you're not the one putting in the IV and you're not the one, it's essentially Kevorkian in the van, which is why he got arrested finally after 130 cases and he was failure of the prosecution to be able to pin him down. He finally did it on 60 minutes a snuff murder, essentially, as he literally on camera injected the woman um, and ended her life. Um, so self-administer means a qualified patient's physical act of ingesting or delivering by another method, medication to end her life. So this is what the slippery slope's about here in Oregon. They've already gotten rid of the 15-day waiting period. I told you that they're now seen as barriers. So if a person's imminently dying, we've got to make sure we can give them assisted suicide before they die naturally. And that's already a law now. That did get passed last year. So terminal 
means, as I said, diabetes now, a degenerative disease, which in the judgment uh, of the doctor or anybody who's involved thinks it's going to contribute to the patient's death. That's enough of a reason for things. This, by the way, was documented in writing by a Norwegian, Fabian Stahl, who actually wrote to the health department at OH, Oregon Health Division, and that's the written response they got. So this is how I wanted to tell you, I, I, there are better ways for us to respond than this kind of utilitarian model. If a person's in pain, you treat the pain. If they're fearful, you address the fears. If they're anxious, you address the anxiety. Worried, you address their worries. You're feeling lonely, be with them. The last one's probably the most important. If you are with somebody, you're physically demonstrating what you're saying, that you're important. And generally, people don't kill themselves when they're with people who want to support their continued lives. You address concerns that they have. You work on a shared understanding of why their life's valuable. I've done this dozens of times with patients who are despondent of encouraging them. You explicitly express their commitment. You affirm their inherent worth. You clearly state your own ethical boundary. And just by doing so, sometimes in doing this, I did this with a multiple sclerosis patient who just said, you know, it's really hard. He's a contractor, a very successful one, made millions. And still, I don't, and I said, I don't know how you do it. He says, well, it is hard at times. And sometimes I get discouraged and I just want to end it all. And I, I, I listened to him. I, he finished out his statement. He said, you know, I realize that with your condition, that you probably do have that at times. I want you to know, though, and I learned he had a 17-year-old daughter. I said, you know, I want you to know that as a doctor, I would continue to care for you at any time, even when you're feeling despondent, and try to do my best to encourage you of the value in your life. And I think if your daughter, 17-year-old daughter, were here with me, she would say the same thing. And, and we would never want to participate in hastening the, your, your life, assisted suicide. And he just said, thank you. You know, the same person who just expressed discouragement before. Um, so this Chochinoff, I learned actually from Chuck Benz, who's giving a presentation this early this afternoon, one of my colleagues in Physicians for Compassionate Care. He made me aware of this article by Chochinoff, who's a palliative care doctor in, in Canada. Basically, these are the questions you can ask people. You know, tell me about what you're thinking. What expectations do you have? What concerns? What fears? Explore their suffering. You know, their current, anticipated. Just by talking about this can be therapeutic. What options for end-of-life care do you think are available? Tell me how you feel, what, what do you believe, what are your family concerns? You start to get to know the person. These are the, the, the questions that get you closer to who that person is. You can set boundaries for yourself. You, you can't be involved in regulating. So like if you're a legislature, you, you, you could vote against it, but you can't get in the committee to actually make the rules for these things. You can refuse to attend. Uh, doctor's offices need to be assisted suicide-free zones. We're going to put a sign with that sort of thing. It'll be in a positive way, not a negative. It'll be, we want to protect you and extend your life, but we're not going to be helping you to end your life. And you need to help the suicidal find a better way is the point. This is the model, my role model in life is the Mother Teresa. Let no one come to you without leaving better and happier. Be the living expression of God's kindness. Kindness in your face, kindness in your eyes, kindness in your smile. And she exuded that. I don't always rise even close to a tenth of Mother Teresa, but this is what we all should aspire to, I think. God doesn't call you to be successful. He calls you to be faithful. All right, I'm going to end there, and I hope we, we, I should have told you at the beginning I love questions, and I write in your cards. I, I failed to do that, but hopefully you have questions. If not, we'll go to shouting them out. I, uh, if you wrote questions down, please let me have them. Thanks. Yes, go ahead. Loud. Um, so they write it down here. How, when you know we have a, a suicide rates of people and teenagers rising, and then of course we have a suicide, assisted suicide and euthanasia, when you do talk to professionals and people get together trying to figure out how to you know, make people not commit suicide, how do they uh, reconcile these two problems? So the question is about when you have a rising assisted suicide rate or suicide rate among young people and, and old people also. But the reality is when you have that, how do you how do you as a, how do you approach this with health professionals that are supposed to be dealing with? They they see this happening, and why aren't they responding to it? Don't don't they, don't they see the connection? Is that yeah? That, okay. So uh, you know it it is um, 
a political football is the reality because if we were just scientific about it, and I think I, to credit of Peter Reagan and I debated, that he probably would accept the fact that yeah, there's probably a suicide contagion. If you, if you show people and you're debating about a public that, gosh, if things are really hard, a solution to your suffering is assisted suicide, or, then why not? This is, this is death with dignity. What could be better than that? Why aren't we celebrating? Why when we, we lose somebody to suicide, are we, are we mourning that? I mean, it's, you have to twit, tie yourself into a pretzel. And yet I think just like in the other end of life, because of the philosophical underpinnings of this, the secular view of life that doesn't view each of us as inherently valuable, made in the image and likeness of God, that's the natural outcome. Sometimes we just have to respect your autonomy. And if I don't, I'm imposing my morals on you. God forbid, you know. Yeah. So, so um, do you foresee um, Oregon moving to doctors deciding to euthanize patients against their will? So, you know, I don't think they'll pass something like that in my lifetime, but the reality is that when you have talk like if you reach a certain age, you know, it's not worthwhile giving you. In a sense, you're passively doing it already. And so the notion of, of authorizing euthanasia against will isn't something that's legal even in the Netherlands. Yet, if you look at the data from the government, two different Remlick reports, which are the government study, anonymous surveys of doctors, they acknowledge that over a thousand patients in one year had not actually asked for euthanasia, but received it from their doctors. So of course the natural question is, why did the doctors do this? Well, she was gonna die anyhow, and I just needed the bed. And then there was a nun, it was another one. Well, when I knew it was against her faith, and again, she was gonna die, and I, I didn't bring it up with her, I just did it. So choice leads to no choice when you talk about life or death issues. This so-called choice is taken away from you because there are other exigencies that supersede your autonomy, like the health system not having enough money. And we've already seen that in Oregon where Barbara Wagner was a school bus driver, retired, had recurrence of her cancer. She went to her doctor in Salem, an oncologist. She and he both wanted to take the drug Darceva, which would have extended her life statistically 45% more chance of being alive in one year than had she not taken it. She was denied by the Oregon Health Plan because her prognosis was unfavorable. But they would give her, in the same letter, pain relief and even assisted suicide, 100% coverage and no coverage for the cancer treatment. And fortunately, one of the evil drug companies stepped up and gave her the drug for free, so she got the opportunity to try the drug. And that's, uh, so I do foresee euthanasia being done in the name of overall economy of scale and efficiency, just as was said, and I shared those national figures who think at certain ages we ought to just not do things for people. So that's at least passive euthanasia, and it's gonna be direct as it is in the Netherlands, unless you think somehow we're better in our moral reasoning than are the Netherlands, and I don't think we are. Can parents and school officials know that minors are truly getting informed consent when they visit a school-based clinic health center? Short answer, no. My dismissal or non-renewal at OHSU is, is related directly to my trying my best to share the truth, not just with patients. There are only about less than a half dozen that complained over almost three years out of hundreds who gave positive feedback. That's not the issue, no. It was, it was also, I'd be talking in the workroom about the end of, uh, uh, you know, what happens after somebody has a sex change operation. I don't know if you, all of you know, it's a whole different topic, but 10 years out after a sex change operation, there's a 19-fold increased chance of suicide. How many people knew that? Yeah. So quite a number of you informed, quite a number of you weren't. All I was doing is sharing a medical fact. It's an anthropologic medical fact. Someone's offended. I wasn't even talking to that person who was offended. And they complain, and that becomes strike, you know, whatever it was. I think there were 12 or 13 strikes. So no, they will not get informed consent from the average person, nor is the doctor even informed. I would say that fewer than one out of 100 doctors know what I just shared with you about the 98-page petition to the Food and Drug Administration. They all believe that oral contraceptives decrease the risk of ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer, and it does. 
but they don't say anything about increasing the risk of breast cancer. Now, thankfully, endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer are relatively rare. Breast cancer is not. It's gone from 1 in 11 women to 1 in 8. And you have to say, I wonder why that is. When millions and millions and millions of women are taking super physiologic doses of powerful female hormones that do affect the breast, it's a class one carcinogen according to the World Health Organization. These are facts. And sharing those facts in the public light in a workroom at OHSU is now consistent with your being not hired again. Tell us about hospice, is it good? Um, some hospices are excellent. The whole concept of hospice was founded by Dame Sisley Saunders who believed that people should live well until they die naturally and that they would, he would support the dying and be with them. No one should die alone. All these concepts, Mother Teresa, Dame Sisley Saunders, she would be turning over in a grave if she saw what was happening down in hospices where some people go in, they're not imminently dying and two days later they're dead. Now, I'm not saying that happens every day. I'm not, I'm not opposing the concept of hospice. Hospice is a good concept, but I no longer can trust the motives of all the people. And when you think about it, it's not just the person running the hospice. There are literally dozens of people involved in the different shifts, and all of them don't have the same views as the people sitting in this audience. That's a fact. And that's not just true in hospices. When I, my dad died 17 years ago at St. Vincent's Hospital, I remember my wife was in the ICU and one of the nurses said, with him there, he, we, you know, he was soporific, kind of in and out of sleep, so you never know what he could hear or wouldn't hear. Uh, he's a World War II veteran, war, creative veteran, Vietnam veteran, 31 years in the service, retired a Brigadier General. The woman didn't know anything about this man who now looked like he'd been in Dachau because of his inanition from a medical error in that hospital, by the way. And the nurse says to my wife, why don't you just let him go? Well, because he's my dad and because he's got value and because I'm hoping that he'll get better. And yet that is, that, and she's probably a good nurse, except that she has a different ethic about the inherent value of all human life. And that's just in a hospital. What would Medicare for all mean to the so-called uh, CNC or other medical issues? Again, I think it'll be just like the Oregon Health Plan where you have to make decisions about, we only have so much of a pot of money and we're going to have to allocate it in the way we want. So I, I, I'm on Medicare, and I will not be promoting Medicare for all. I, I don't think that I have quite as good a coverage as I had when I was working and employed. I'm grateful that I do have coverage. I don't think it's a bad concept inherently, but again, it's a government making decisions about what's worthwhile and what's not. And so far, I haven't had a lot of confidence in their, their supporting federal dollars. Uh, a third of Planned Parenthood comes from the federal government. I, I don't think they make good health decisions about uh, how they use our money. How do we as elderly patients ourselves get, uh, uh, protect against unethical physicians and hospice directors? I think you have to ask. You cannot assume. As I said, they're very good doctors in other aspects, but they may embrace this concept. So you do have to ask. If you don't ask, you won't know. You'll be surprised how such nice people actually believe the solution to suffering is the end of your life at some point and have already engaged in it. I think the medical director, OHSU's medical oncology, he said, um, I've done more of these than anybody. He's made home visits to do this. That's what he said in testimony to the legislature just this last summer. Do I worry about hospitals deciding to stop treating terminally ill? Yes, I do. And that's already happened. There are national cases of that, and there are also international cases of that. Um, they're deciding that it's not worthwhile, even though the family wants to try to, to do things that would be reasonable. Is organ donor protocol done ethically or not? I think organ donors is, is actually a wonderful life-giving aspect. There's concerns about lots of aspects about it, though. Again, is the person making truly informed consent? Is it a single organ where you can't take the organ out without the person dying? In other words, it's, it's organ harvesting by euthanasia. Uh, it's, it's death by organ ha harvesting. So there are some aspects that are being written about in the, in the literature, in the peer-reviewed literature in medicine, that are suggesting that this is a way to get a two-for-one special, if you will. Totally unethical. Um, can you... Describe specific situations in which PA has proved to be a tragedy that even, um, even uh, proponents might be appalled by it. 
Well, yeah, when I talked about the Michael Friedland case that I just described with you, I was impressed that Peter Reagan took responsibility. He said, you know, he really felt uncomfortable when he really learned that this guy had this cyclical depression. He didn't know that. Um, again, I don't think he was trying to do slovenly work, but it's, I can't know everything about a patient's background. Sometimes I'm told by family members about what's really going on that's different than what the patient says. So uh, I think that there are people who disagree with me or us that do have integrity and can acknowledge it. I think the, the, the national leaders uh, you say, if it happens, it's so rare, it's not, it doesn't offset the great good that it, it does. So does euthanasia increase people suffering from severe mental illness? Um, does euthanasia increase people suffering from severe mental illness? I think that um, there are cases, and if at our table you have a, a sheet that talks about um, the movie Fatal Flaws. How many of you have seen that? Quite a number, but not many. Go by our table. Chuck Vance is staffing it. Um, it. There's a sheet. It's very inexpensive. It's like $40 for this video done by Kevin Dunn, who's a, been a videographer ever since he was a child. Uh, and basically does a, a superb job without any bias of letting people on both sides talk in paragraphs. And it speaks for itself as you see a young person who has a, a, a in and out of depression, just like a Michael Freeland, who says she wants this. And she's been working for years, literally, interviewing in the, this movie to get this. And she finally gets it. And they're still remaining in contact. They're following exactly what I said in terms of befriending this person who has this suicidal wish. And they do a video of her, and she's holding up the cocktail that she's got, and she's going to plan on drinking. And basically, um, she says, you know, this is, this is relief of my suffering, and she takes it. So she has nothing wrong with her in terms of something that would cause her to die otherwise, except that she just felt despondent about her life. And instead of us supporting her in some way as a community of, of people, of, of, of her friends, and love her in that way, she ends up in that way ending her life. How do we go back to evidence-based medical research and practice? Um, you know, the previous speaker, I think, did a wonderful job of that, and we all have to be diligent about educating ourselves and looking at the facts and then making others aware of them, even people with whom we disagree. At a, at a dinner party with my daughter, my second daughter and her husband, and visiting their kids, my grandkids, and somebody else uh, in the family who doesn't agree with our point of view, uh, we at least made an effort to reach out and have a respectful dialogue. And I think we're all called to do that. And we don't do that, we're, we're failing to use the gifts and talents we have to uh, provoke people into maybe being better versions of themselves, if you will. Anyway, I appreciate it. I think I'm out of time. And thank you all for your attentiveness and your great questions. <laughs>